week of the September 11th attacks. So uh, before we get started, if we could uh, take a moment, silence and remember this about the victims of uh, Thank you. So today we are joined by Maria McKelvey. Maria is an award-winning writer, educator, actress, singer, musician. And about storyteller, she combines her many talents to create innovative programs, weaving history, literature, music, and art. She performs in community theater and gives living history presentations as Beatrix Potter, Lisa May Alcott, Dr. Eliza Hughes, and other historical characters for schools, libraries, historical societies, and civic organizations, such as the Greenbrier, Philadelphia City Institute Library, the 67th Street Library of the New York Public Library System, and the Morgan Library and Museum in New York City. And just a few of the many venues where she's performed. As a writer, Maria has submitted entries for the annual West Virginia Writers Competition, garnering awards most notably in the Pearl S. Buck Writing for Social Change category. Currently, she's researching writing a biography of the last Washington of Mount Vernon, which is the topic of today's talk. Maria is a native of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and now resides in the Hinsville townhouse in the historic Victorian old town in West Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, Maria McKelvey. Sure. Soldier rest by warfare or dream of fighting fields no more. Sleep the sleep that knows not breaking. Mourn. A toy or night waiting. It's a poem by Sir Walter Scott from the year of eight. And Sir Walter Scott would have been an author that people in the 1800s would have been reading. I think it's a very appropriate way to start. Today's presentation. Anyone recognize where this battlefield is? What did you say? Very good. This gentleman said the Antietam. So why do you recognize it as Antietam versus any other battlefields? There are many times. All right. I was just there again uh, in early May, May 2nd. Um, 2021 as May with my brother and sister-in-law. And this battlefield never ceases to, uh, it's just an awesome place to visit. And we were there at dusk. So I've been there in the afternoon and early morning, but that was the first time I've been there at dusk. And there was nobody there. And it just seemed appropriate to start it with this slide. So, Antietam, if you've never been there, I hope you have a chance to go. So, a couple of years ago, about 2013, I saw a news story about a man who, uh, there was a lot of folklore connected with his history, with his name, and so forth. And I became very interested in this story, and kind of inspired. And this is what they said about, what was said about this man. Yeah, turn, it, turn it on the side. Thank 
A man forced into decisions, sometimes by circumstances, sometimes by his own actions, which he understands will change his life, but whose outcomes he cannot foresee. I can see that quote applying to a lot of historical figures, could you? And I think we're surrounded by somebody right here in this auditorium. So, who is this man I was interested in? It doesn't want to see what it's like. She just told me what it is. Who is this? <laughs> what? Richard II. This is King Richard. Third. Third. <laughs> I didn't know anything about King Richard the Third other than I heard of him. He's killed at Bosworth Field. We got the next year. He's killed in 1485 at the Battle of Bosworth in England. And the story I became interested in was. A woman named Philippa Langley, who would go on to like a Richard III society, was convinced that all the folklore about Richard III and where he was buried was incorrect. Instead of the folklore saying that he was thrown into the river after he was killed at Bosworth Field, she believed that he was buried under a parking lot in Western England. And she also believed that Shakespeare's <clears throat> version of Richard III was rather incorrect as well, as far as his deformities and so Anyway, she managed to convince people at the University of Leicester, archaeologists, and so forth, that indeed this could be possible. And indeed, and indeed, they dug up the parking lot and found the lead lined coffin and with forensic knowledge and testing and so forth, found that indeed it was the bones of Richard By the way, I, I, I love YouTube. If you go on YouTube, you can find videos of this entire episode. There's also a book written by Mike Hiss about this entire historical event. Eventually, the Queen of England had to acknowledge her relative Richard III, and he was buried with royal honors at the Cathedral in Leicester. And you can see that on YouTube as well. So why do I bring this up? Why did it inspire me? It made me realize that one, history is about people. And what happens to people and the decisions they make. And I'm always interested in how people get from point A to point B to point C and how they end up where they are or what happens to them. And in between are all these other things that are happening, which are historical events. But in the end, it's about people. So the whole story inspired me. So, so thank you. John's trying to help me because I really You can try it again. No, okay. okay, we'll do it with the next one. So anyway, my last, I ended up moving, I've been wheeling for a long time, moved to book class in Randolph County, West Virginia. And my last house was on a mountain, about 3,500 feet, right off Route 219, which heads south, all the way through West Virginia. And 
my last two years of teaching, I was always passing this thing, this marker that was on the hillside. And it was around a little really treacherous curve and curve up on the hillside. You know, one day I just thought, I'm going to stop and look at this. So I did. This is what I found. Great. So I'm looking at it. Lieutenant Colonel John Augustine Washington, CSA of Mount Vernon, aide de camp to General Robert E. Lee, killed Elkwater. By the way, this is at the point where Elkwater is on Route 219, the old little town of Elkwater. Right now, you go through, you don't even know if you've been through it. Killed September 13, 1861, buried in Zion Churchyard, Charlestown, West Virginia. And I thought, the descendant of George Washington doing out in Western Virginia, in the wilds of Western Virginia. That was my question. Just like Philippa Langley had her question about Richard III, that was my question. And out of sheer curiosity, I had the, uh, he was one of the directors at the Mount Vernon Library, actually the CEO of Mount Vernon one time, I met him, told him what I was working on, and he said to me, very quizzically, you know, I got you interested in this. And he said, your curiosity. And that's what got me started. Led me to years of research in this because really nothing had been written about him except how he died in Western Virginia. There's a whole life around this person. And again, <coughs> what am I interested in? People, and how they get from A to B in the decision making. So, this deadly encounter in Western Virginia. Tell you a little more about this portrait later, but at one point, we I mean, know he died, so I'm not spilling the beans here. But in, uh, in 1906, there was a memorial for him where this portrait was presented. Not sure where the original is right now. Um, so I wanted to tell you about that. So, where did we start? So, the first place I went to. Naturally, because I didn't live far, being there in Randolph County, was over the mountain to Charlottesville, to University of Virginia. And how many of you have gone to special collection libraries? One, I hope you all go because. Well, of course, the day of COVID right now, I couldn't get into Brown University in August because there wasn't a student there. And I wanted to do research. I guess if I, I was going to do like a spur of the moment, hop in and go look for something, and I wasn't allowed. So right now in the era of COVID, I think things have changed a little bit. But, you know, University of Virginia, when I first went there a couple of years ago, you showed your driver's license, you go in, you sign a few papers, and Go in the special collections behind the state glass wall. And you tell them what you would like to look at. And they come out with a so University of Virginia folder. And so the first folder I got, first one I ever looked at in all this research, said letters to John A. Washington III's daughters. I thought this ought to be really good. I sit down, flip open the folder. I nearly fell in total surprise because the first letter on the top says, I didn't even read where it was from in the date. I read, My dear Maria. <laughs> Do you ever like feel the hair stand up on the back of your neck? I never, that happened. That really does happen. That happened to me, and I'm reading. Gosh, my dear Maria, 
your destiny can't balance this day. It says, Camp on Valley Mountain, August the 7th, 1861. I've since learned from the Washington family that Maria is pronounced Mariah. And her name, she's there on the right, Anna Mariah Washington. And I have to thank Beverly Chagrin um, from Maranac, New York. Thank you, Beverly, for watching, for sending me this photo of Anna Mariah Washington. Probably when she was in her, I'm going to estimate mid 20s. Anyway, that was my first experience here. So, I'll come back to this one. So, John A. Washington III, he was born in 1821, May the 3rd, 1821, in Charlestown, West Virginia. And his mother, can you go to the next slide? He's born at Blakely. This is my photograph of Blakely. It's still there. It's a private residence. But John, or, um, John A. Washington II, John A. Washington III's father, married Jane Charlotte Blackburn, very prominent. Um, Jane Charlotte's two her grandfather fought alongside George Washington and was mortally wounded, severely wounded at the Battle of Trenton. Um, anyway, he married Jane Charlotte Blackburn and they moved to Blakely. Well, John A. Washington II also had a brother, Bushrod Corbin, and the brother built his house, I would say it's like a football field's length. Facing his brother's house. And you can go there today and see that in Charlestown. So the two brothers lived across from each other with their families. It was understood that eventually um, John A. Washington II would inherit Mount Vernon, Mount Island. So he built his house a little smaller than his brothers. It looks a little smaller than <laughs> I've never been inside this one. He's, I've heard that it's been extensively renovated. So, you know, I don't know how much of the house from 1821 or you know, 30s or 40s would exist anymore. But so, what happened? So, George Washington married Martha Augustus, and they did not have any children of their own, although he adopted hers. But they didn't have any children of their own. So, when George Washington died, he could not leave Mount Vernon to her children. And so what he did was he left Mount Vernon to the oldest nephew, and that was Judge Bushrod Washington, one who became our chief of the Supreme Court. And Bushrod and his wife lived there at Mount Vernon for 20 some years. He commuted back and forth to the capital, which was at Philadelphia. The original capital was in Philadelphia. And so he went back and forth there. And on one of those trips, Bushrod died in Philadelphia. His wife went to go retrieve his body and she died on the way home. Isn't that amazing? They had no children. So now the estate, Mount Vernon, has to go to the next oldest nephew, and that was John A. Washington II. He had Mount Vernon, I'm trying to think, Bushrod died 1829. Um, and then Johnny Washington II inherited Mount Vernon. But the family still commuted back and forth visiting Lake, so they never really gave up. All right, so we go to the next one. So, John A. Washington II, unfortunately, wasn't at Mount Vernon very long. He's there 
what, three years? And he died at Mount Vernon. When I read the account, you know, ostensibly he probably died of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis kind of wove its way through the Washington family, um, as it did a lot of families. Um, when he died, he gave the estate to his widow, Jane Charlotte Blackburn Washington, who's wearing a white cat in this photo, the widow's cat. John Augustine Washington III is the this is John Augustine Washington III. And this is his sister, Anna Mariah Thomasina. This is his brother, Richard Blackburn. And this little fellow here, this is Noblet Herbert, who was a relative who came to live with the Washington family. And they did that a lot back then. They would just take in relatives who were orphaned or whatever, but he lived with them for a while. Anyway, there were two other siblings of John A. Washington III. There was a brother, George, an older brother, who died when he was nine. So I would think probably Mount Vernon would have gone to him eventually, but he died at the age of nine. And then I believe. So Christian Scott, and Christian was a female name in the Washington family. She was only a few months old. This portrait, John said in my introduction, I love to be part in with this because, you know, our artists documented everything historically. So what we have here, the man on the right is John Gatsby Chapman. He's from Alexandria, born there in 1808, and he was educated at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. And he painted this portrait. And I have to tell you, um, right now, this is the cover of one of my favorite books, um, only because the, the original portrait, if you ever want to see it, is at George Washington's. <coughs> hold on, let me get the whole title correct so I don't, the people in Alexandria don't get upset. George Washington's Masonic Memorial in Alexandria, Virginia. And it's virtually life size. And it's hanging on a wall. And it was really hard to get a really good photograph of it with light coming in the window. So I took a photo of the left floor here. But it's enormous, the original painting. Anyone ever been to the Masonic Memorial? That's Right smack dab in the middle of Alexandria, right by the train station. So Jane Charlotte Blackburn did everything she could to give John A. Washington III a very thorough, rounded Episcopal education. And at that time, we didn't have public schools, per se, at least not in this part of the country in Alexandria. And so one of the first schools he went to was someone's estate. And they hired a tutor. He took the boat up the Potomac River to this estate house, which I've actually been to. Um, and probably he and a couple of other young sons from prominent families sat around the dining room table where the owner of this house gave us tea and cake that afternoon. Is that not cool? And that's where they were educated. And then at some point, she sent him to an Episcopal school that was started in North Philadelphia. Also, one that you'd have to take a boat on the Delaware River to get there. And parts of that school, I found them, are still remaining. Isn't that amazing? And there's like this falling down historical marker there, but parts of it are still there, turned into apartment houses. And after that, he was only there for a brief time, and then that school closed off for lack of funds. And eventually, he went to school in Alexandria, and then eventually, he went on to the University of Virginia. This is the rotunda that was designed by Thomas Jefferson. The book you see next to it, let's see if I can find it. Right here, right here. John A. Washington. And then his birth date, 
and his mother's name. This is the matriculation book that I saw there at UVA from 1838, excuse me, from the 1838-39 matriculation record. John attended class there at UVA from 1838 to 1841 in the School of Law. And his first year classes, you can read all of this in the special collections. They have the original books. Included modern languages, French, chemistry, moral philosophy, which was logic and ethics and law. And he lived on campus. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to UVA. They have, in some of these schools, you just have to go to visit them. Some of these marvelous old universities. Yeah, you know, it's a little brown, a big, uh, what they call it, a big green. And down the side, one side were the education buildings and the students were taught, and the other side, places where they lived. And by the time I went, the kids were checking in, and one of them let me look into one of them. And they were tiny, and originally they did burn wood or coal in the fireplaces. Well, John A. Washington, from reading a lot of his letters, he had some kind of an ailment, whether he had tuberculosis or he was having respiratory problems, but he could not stay in that dorm room. I guess it was making him sick. And then he asked permission to move downtown. I checked the discipline records there at UVA. He never had a disciplinary mark against his record. One time he asked if he could buy his horse to campus and back from the Mount Vernon. And another time he asked permission. This is all documented in this discipline record. He asked permission if he could visit Wires Cave on an excursion with a couple of other guys and he asked for permission to do that. But he never had a discipline mark against him. Now, UVA didn't really assign diplomas then, so at some point he left and went back to Mount Vernon. And then in 1843, he married his relative, Eleanor Love Selden. The Seldens <coughs> also were a very important, prominent family in Virginia. And he and Eleanor were married February 16, 1843. I don't remember because it's the day before my birthday. <laughs> February 16, 1843, by the uncle, Reverend Edward Russell Lippitt. And that's why I went to Brown University at the beginning of mid August because he graduated from Brown University. And I was trying to find out more information about him, which I did the last couple of weeks. So that was pretty good. She was from the house you see on the right called Exeter that her grandfather had built. And that house is no longer in existence. It mysteriously burned down in a 1985. Um, before that, though, in 1861, the house, the property, was the site of the Battle of Ball's Bluff. On October 21st, 1861, a Confederate general, Jubal Early, used the house for his headquarters. Now, when you try to go see Exeter, you can park in the Walmart parking lot. That's where it is, underneath that somewhere. This is a photograph of Mount Vernon in disrepair. James Charlotte eventually deeded over Mount Vernon to her son, John A. Washington. She's a very fascinating woman. You know, we talk about, I'm going to say this, and I can see young women in Tomo Women's Rights. They say, James Charlotte Blackburn, talk about a woman with property rights. Her husband gave her Mount Vernon, and she ran it for something like 15, 20 years. Because John was still too young to acquire property, know how to run the place. But she did. She managed the estate. And she's a very admirable woman. She was very um, well involved in the whole physical church movement. She was very well known in uh, Philadelphia circles as well as Washington, D.C. circles, and Alexandria. She's, she's well worth a biography herself. When she finally deeded Mount Vernon over to John A. Washington III, it was in disrepair. 
and it was costing a lot of money to run the state. Not only that, as with many of those plantations in Virginia, the land was becoming depleted from tobacco. I used to know a song, tobacco's but a waste of me. Tobacco's but a waste Anyway, it wasted the land. And so trying to grow crops was really difficult. You know, he tried fishing, uh, the waters of the Potomac. He did that for a while. He did some timbering. Uh, he did some land speculation out in Chicago. Um, and it just couldn't seem to make ends meet. On top of that, boat excursions began to Mount Vernon. Everybody wanted to go see the home of President Washington. And people would get off the boat. There's letters there where he's talking about people peeking in the windows of the house. They'd wander into the house on the property, you know. And John A. Washington, they had that point in time, he had his four oldest teenage daughters. I say that not at that point, they were teenagers. But yeah, I think he felt a little upset that these people were coming forward to visit Mount Vernon. So the story goes that we'll go to the next one. Well, before we do that, this is another view of Mount Vernon, the one on the right, from a painting done by the man on the left, and Eastman Johnson. The painting was done of Mount Vernon showing, and what makes it unique this painting is that it shows the slave quarters and the disrepair again of Mount Vernon. This is 1857. Eastman Johnson was somehow a distant relation of the Washington family. He was visiting for the wedding. And he and John Washington, I saw in the camp where they stayed up late at night drinking wine and having a grand old time. Anyway, um, Eastman Johnson became really famous for his portraits uh, of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Nathaniel Lovehorn, Abraham Lincoln, Rob Waldo Emerson. Um, anyway, so just another view. John A. Washington wanted to sell, he and his mother wanted to sell Mount Vernon to the United States government or to the state of Virginia. And they both said, we don't want it. So, at one point, now we can do the Okay, so I'm not getting it. Okay, that's all right. So let me just see where I am. Okay. Back up a minute. So one of the things John did while he was trying to run this estate, he kept farm journals. And I spent, I don't know, months in the Mount Vernon in the vault at the library. Literally, they lock him in the vault every year. Hours and yet they asked permission to come and go, and it was just me and a table and a bunch of records. But I got to see the five farm journals, and this is what they look like here on the left. The lighting wasn't real good in the wall, so I didn't care about that. And on the right is a page open to May the 5th, 18, let me check my notes, May the 5th, 1851. And we talk about strange climate things that occur. This is May the 5th, and he's talking about a snowstorm in Alexandria that fell three or four inches of snow, and it was so heavy and wet that all the boughs of the trees were bent down. And he was trying to harvest the wheat crop at the time. So I found that very interesting. All of these five journals, we're in the possession of Mary Washington Schaffner, Washington, or Mary Washington Schaffner, who I got to meet and befriend, and her son Florence is listening and watching. Uh, the family um, donated these five farm journals to Mount Vernon. Mary Catherine Washington Schaffner was descended from John A. Washington III's oldest son, Florence. And they're now in the vault at Mount Vernon. So, all right, now we'll get into it. All right, so 
So on the right, you see one of the, the folders. While I was in the vault, one day I counted this up. I looked at, I don't know, a couple of times. I was there for months over a span of three years. 35 boxes with 20 folders in each, and I examined at least 700 letters. Um, copious letters. At one point, the story goes that a Mrs. Cunningham was riding on the excursion boat past Mount Vernon, and she was appalled to see the dilapidated state of Mount Vernon and thought, you know, what an awful thing for the, the home of our first president that should be enshrined. And she said to her daughter, and Pamela Cunningham, that might be a project for you. And so Aunt Pamela Cunningham, you see on the left, started a campaign supported by Edward Everett. Anyone remember who Edward Everett was? Go ahead. Go ahead. He was spoken for Lincoln. Right. Gentleman that spoke before Lincoln at Gettysburg, Edward Everett gave speeches all over the United States in support of Anne Pamela Cunningham and her project to purchase Mount Vernon from John A. Washington III. So, who was Anne Pamela? She was a uh, born on a Rosemont plantation in South Carolina. She was an invalid due to a riding accident. And she became known as the, quote, Southern matron, unquote. And she made appeals for donations from the ladies of the South to help purchase and restore Mount Vernon. There is a copious correspondence between Anne Pamela and John A. Washington. And this is one of them. You see there on the slide. What was also interesting just about every letter he wrote had a rough draft and he put on a different color piece of paper. It really confused me at first, and then I realized he wrote rough drafts on like blue legal paper and then he wrote the final copy. And he has, this one's dated October 28, 1856. No. On my return home today, after a prolonged absence, I find your letters on September 30 and August, or October 21st, 21. With every disposition to justify the ladies of the South, whom you so eloquently represent, I must yet reduct the up to date here to the position I have already taken, viz. to dispose of Mount Vernon, however, only to the United States or to Virginia directly. Sincerely regretting that I am unable to concur in all your views on this subject, I am now. With the most profound respect, your obedient servant, John A. Washington. Well, eventually, I don't want to say he capitulated, but eventually he did sell Mount Vernon to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, who owned it to this day. So, it is not a property owned by the United States government, so it's not a federal property. And it's not a state-owned property, it's privately owned. Isn't that amazing after all these years? Anyway, he sold it to the ladies at that time. Go back here. I'll read you a little mathematical figure. He sold it to them in 1858 for $200,000, which caused consternation throughout the United States that the great, great nephew of George A. Washington would sell the estate for that much to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. But they paid it. One time in 2014, I thought I would look that up, for $200,000, then would be in 2014, and it came out to $5,405,405. One day I picked up a realtor magazine there in Alexandria and checked properties around there. 
Guess how much they were going for? Five million. Was he not pressured or what? <laughs> I mean, one could say that I suppose. Anyway, after he sold Val Vernon, he went searching for a property and he went into Piedmont um, and found an estate called Waveland in Marshall, Virginia. It used to be called Salem, Virginia, and then became Marshall, Virginia. And I went looking for it one day and found it. Nobody was around. I got out of my car. I climbed across this chain link, like one of those chains across the driveway. I just climbed over and went up on the lawn with my camera. I thought, oh, I just want to find a picture. And as far as I knew from the people at the local library, nobody lived there. So I thought, okay, well, I'll just take a picture. And right as I snapped the picture, what do you think happened? This Jeep came from around the side of the house. I thought, all right, I'm going to have to apologize here. So I pulled up, stuck my hand in, and that's how I met George Thompson, who to this day is a really good friend of mine. And he's been a wonderful um, benefactor to me in the way of uh, helping me um, secure documents from the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. I've been at the house there a couple of times, had tours of Waveland here. Um, so it's been a wonderful relationship that started off somewhat auspiciously. The noteworthy thing about Waveland is that I have a brochure here that Mr. Thompson published about his estate. By the way, it is also privately owned, as I found out. Um, it has bathrooms that were constructed in those late 1850s when he had the house renovated. He and his family still lived in Mount Vernon. They worked out a relationship where he could still live in Mount Vernon while the house was being renovated in 1859 and 60. But the house has three bathrooms in it. That for that time period um, was actually considered a little more advanced than the White House. It says, well, let's put it this way the, uh, the family holder, you know what we're talking about there, we say the family, it was out back. So, but there were bathtubs in this bathroom. They were installed by the plumber that had recently put plumbing in the White House. Right. The sides are paneled in wood, and all of it rests on like a low drainage kind of uh, container to ca catch the water. Um, it's like eight, uh, it sends out eight to ten inches wider than the tub. Um, the lavatory is marble with panel covered underneath. And to supply the tub, how did they get the water there, do you think? Yes, it was a cistern. And where do you think it was? It was on the roof. Yeah, which was really innovative for that period of time. It was a 1,322 gallon circular brick cistern, 15 feet wide and 18 feet deep. And then they had it all running down to these bathrooms. Isn't that amazing? So we go to the next slide. So here we have a portrait of John A. Washington III, Daguerreotype. I'm not pronouncing that right. I'm never sure how to pronounce that, but Daguerreotype. And he was taken by a studio called the White Horse Studio, because I kind of, it's in reverse here, but one day I figured out the name that's printed up there on that and looked that up. And that those photography studios were in New York City, Baltimore, Washington, and Richmond. <coughs> I'm going to guess, this is a guess, I don't know for sure, um, although the family owns this photograph, um, Walter Washington in Charlestown, West Virginia, featured it in his article in the Jefferson County Historical Society magazine. Um, I think he had this portrait taken before he left the Civil War. 
I'm just guessing. I don't know for sure. Anyway, when they finally moved into Wakeland, he got situated. Eleanor was pregnant for the eighth time. They already had seven children. She was pregnant for an eighth time, but on October, I think it was the eighth, she died in childbirth there at Wakeland. And so there was Johnny Washington left with seven kids. Um, but when the South seceded, and in April, Firing on Fort Sumter in 1861, John A. Washington, and I still haven't figured out how this exactly happened. Um, I don't know whether Jefferson Davis asked him to join General Lee's staff, or John A. Washington asked to join staff. I'm not sure how it happened. They were related. Um, he ended up on the um, Robert E. Lee's staff in Richmond, Virginia. Before he left, though, on the right hand side, this is in a collection of colonial leaves, but I actually got to see this. That's the curator's hands holding it open for me. It's in a little envelope all sealed up. It's violets from Mount Vernon that he collected and pressed. Isn't that amazing? And there they are. And the curator went ahead and opened it for me, so I could see them. And it's in a collection. Um, one of Johnny's Washington's daughters, Eliza's young one on the left. Uh, this is a photograph shared by courtesy of Mary Washington Shatner's family. She was called Sister or Lily. She'll appear again here in a couple of slides, but. Um, she was kind of basically the archivist for the family. So before he left, he collected flowers from Mount Hermon. It's pretty unusual, isn't it? All right. So at one point, the war wasn't going very well in Western Virginia, which now is what? West Virginia. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to read you a little bit. Let me show you this. Since we're talking about books today, to the book sale. My best friend, Hunter Lesser, if you want to read about the war in Western Virginia, this is the book to read. You can see how I've got it annotated here. Sometimes it kind of frustrates me when I was looking through the books back there for the book sale. We forget about the Battle of Philippi. In Philippi, West Virginia, which was fought when? June 3rd, 1861. We forget about the Battle of Ridge Mountain, right outside of Elkins, West Virginia, which was fought before Manassas, July and 11th, 1861. Yeah, I was moving the index back there. Just to check and see if they ever mentioned those battles. Anyway, it wasn't going well. That Rich Mountain the Confederates were in a rout. Um, you know, what were they doing there anyway? Well, right up where you see Morgantown, it's the railroad. The you know, railroad that cut across you now. And what do we know about railroads in the Civil War? That was the lifeline of the battle, wasn't it? Get the supplies and men to the battlefield with railroads. You had McClellan over here. So from Richmond, after the Battle of Rich Mountain, which is right outside of the in this area, the Confederates were sent in a route over the mountains into the Shenandoah. And in that route, General Garnett was killed. He was, he was the first highest ranking general on the lead on the, uh, the Army of Northern Virginia <coughs> in the Civil War, the first one. He was shot dead by a sharpshooter while he was trying to get his 
people and equipment over into the Shenandoah. So they were sent in a route. McClellan claimed victory. There's a little town called Beverly, right outside of the Mountains. What's really interesting about this whole area of West Virginia, the battlefields of Ridge Mountain, uh, Philippi, this whole area, if you go there today, it has the, the terrain hasn't changed much. And there hasn't been a lot of development. And you can get a real idea of how little wilderness it was out there at that time. I used to teach a little girl way up in these mountains here. It used to take me like two hours from my house to get up there to this little town up there. And I used to look at the view to myself, wow, on that trying to move all that canyon on these mountainsides and people. And what they ended up doing was they were trying to get out so quick they just dumped everything over the hillsides. And I'll bet you to this day, and some of these ravines, I'll bet you there's still civil war materials down. But anyway, so they got set in a wrap. McClellan went back to his headquarters and sent the first telegram of the Civil War to President Lincoln. Victory at Rich Mountain. He actually wasn't the president of the actual battle. He was sitting in Beverly while the battle was being fought. But he was a credit for it. And at that point, we had Manassas after that. And that's when President Lincoln called McClellan to become the person to lead the armies to the yeah. army. After that, he said that telegraph. So that's what they were doing. So President Davis sent Lee, Walter H. Taylor, who was also his aide to camp along with John A. Washington, to go to that part of what was then Western Virginia. They left Richmond, which would be over here. They left Richmond. They took the cars, as they used to call the train, to Stanton, Virginia. And then they rode on horseback to Monterey, from Monterey, right over the mountain to Huntersville, West Virginia now. I used to live, as I said before, my last house was in what was in Pocahontas County at one point and then Randolph County. If you travel 219 right now, remember that letter I showed you to his daughter? This letter to his daughter, where he describes his journey, I read this and it's chilling because the terrain hasn't changed. He talks about the mountains and the, the green grass to the top of the hills and how this creek disappears under the road. It's all there still. It's amazing. And part of this, this is why I'm interested in John A. Washington, too. This was written in camp. Yeah, there's not one mistake in it. He must not have done a rough draft. The only mistake I could find was Nax Creek. He spelled it without the K. Which would be understandable, right? Max Creek. But I thought, what kind of a man writes a letter like this? His daughter was 10 years old at the time. That's a beautiful letter. So there they were. My last house in Randolph County was on Valley Mountain, where Robert E. Lee's troops were stationed. I was on the actual encampment. Um, so every day, you know, going out to walk the dogs, I used to think, wow, well, that Johnny Washington rode horseback to you. <laughs> kind of enchanted thinking about it. Anyway, so they went out to Western Virginia. And so we have Robert E. Lee here, and on the right is Walter Taylor. So they were assigned by Jefferson Davis to coordinate the efforts of Generals Lori, Wise, and Floyd, who weren't doing very well working together and coordinating. Taylor at the time was only 23, and John A. Washington was 40. And both of them were aide camps to 
Barbie Lee. They actually again were related. I actually found a genealogy chart where Taylor is somehow distantly related to Robert E. Lee as well. And there on Valley Mountain, they left the park of anything for runners, but just the three of them on horseback in a wagon with all their items in it. And they shared a tent on Valley Mountain. And here we have a map of the Tiger Valley. And I saw this map at the University of Virginia. It was the most interesting thing I've ever seen. You know, the folders, when I see people, they're doing these special collections and they're bringing out these big maps. And I think, oh, wow, look at that. So, I, you know, I got online and I asked for a map that I wanted to see of the Tiger's Valley. And I thought the woman would come out with this pretty big map and spread it out on the table and not get to look at it. And she came out with a little folder. I thought, okay, it. She lays it on the table, and I open it, and inside was this little man, hand drawn. And it wasn't much bigger than my copy. Isn't that amazing? Like five and a half by about 11 inches, a little bit bigger than this, in three colors of ink. And it's of the area where I used to live, the Tiger Valley. And it was on grid paper and it was trifolded. So it was a map drawn in the field, most likely, and probably used by the officers to move about the Tiger's Valley. The Federals. Right about in here, we've got Valley Mountain. So my house, my former home, was right in this area. So Lee was in camp here on Valley Mountain. And then the Federals were all the way up here, the Union Army, up here. And we'll get to their photos in a minute, but they were up here in Hot Water. And the map maker, anyone want to guess? It's this man. Jebediah Hotchkiss, born in 1828 in Windsor, New York. He's fascinating. He was a former teacher like me. He was a math maker to Robert E. Lee in Western Virginia. And eventually he became the chief topographical engineer for Stonewall Jackson until Stonewall Jackson's death. For the rest of the war, Jebediah Hotchkiss drew maps for Robert E. Lee in the Confederacy. When I read a little piece where it said when the war was over and Hotchkiss surrendered to the, to the Union Army and he was his friend, Grant gave him his maps back and then at one point paid him to draw the maps for the official record. So maybe some of those map books back there, the maps all drawn by Joe and I Hotchkiss. I think he's fascinating. I think he's brilliant. To have sat out in the field and drawn this. I think it's amazing. Okay. So here's what that area looks like. I used to live to the left somewhere here. This is Mingo Flats, the road I used to live on. Up here is Valley Mountain, all part of the Alleghenies. And right about here, was a spot called the Nam. That's where Lee was stationed with John A. Washington and Walter Taylor, right up in here. There was also a forward camp, and there was also one before you came to Valley Mountain. Being a bit of snowshoe, ski resort. All right. That's the area we're talking about. You know what that looks like, don't you? Mountainous, twisty roads. So Mingo Flats was a geographical anomaly in the middle of the mountains, about 3,500 feet. There were all these flat areas in between ridges. Great fortification area. And that's kind of what it looked like. All right, go to the next one. 
Johnny Washington wrote a number of letters home from the mountain top there. One of them was to his attorney, Gustavus A. Myers, who was his attorney in the sale of Mount Vernon to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. And in his letter, John A. Washington, again, no rough draft, tells him about life in camp. This is one of my favorite. It's almost like, you know, John A. Washington was a risky breath that's out for the Boy Scouts camping. I think he must have loved it after all the craziness of the sale of Mount Vernon. He says, um, When people are determined to be satisfied, as I believe we were, it is astonishing how little one really requires to be happy and comfortable. One wash, with an occasional resort to a, to a distant book for our evolutions, three tin plates for eating from, and an equal number of cups for tea, coffee, and water, and those tin dishes, one for meat, one for bread, and one for vegetables and rice, with a knife, fork, and spoon, each constitute our table establishment and very good meals, I can assure you, we made. Breakfast at 6 a.m., dinner and supper combined at 6 p.m. with a hard biscuit, somewhat softened by the hypometric condition of the atmosphere. And he tells about arriving from Huntersville with just the two of them and sleeping in a tent, in one tent. But that was his description of life on Valley Mountain. All right. So they're there. They got there like at the end of July on Valley Mountain. And I lived in that area for 10, 11 years. And I can tell you, whatever weather is happening elsewhere, on Valley Mountain, it's like no other. That's why it's a ski resort up there. In September, it can be cold enough to snow. And it has snow. When I lived there, we would get frost and snow in the middle of September. Fall would start, the first leaf would turn probably mid July. And you could never like count on the weather forecast on TV. That's kind of a joke because. It, it wasn't any good there where we lived on video flats. So basically, I just look out the window and look at the clouds and get an idea of what the weather was going to be like. When they were there, when the men were in camp there, it started out pleasant enough. And they couldn't get over the coolness, the beauty, the mountains, until it started raining. And one veteran said, he said it rained for like 30 days, months. And of course, if you've ever been in the mountains like this, you've got all these wonderful little mountain woodlands coming down as they get filled with water and they come crashing down the hillsides. And pretty soon, the men were miserable. They were dying from typhoid fever, chills, whatever. And they were buried wherever they died, basically. Um, Hunter tells me, he said, you know, Maria, he said, there's probably hundreds Hundreds of men buried between Beverly and Lewisburg along 219. Because they, where they died, they, they didn't have the National Cemetery concept. So it's all hallowed ground. Those of us that live there, we saw it as hallowed ground. This is a photograph of the top of Valley Mountain. Remember, I pointed to the knob? This is the knob. This is what it looks like. My house, my old house, I had three years ago, was right over that hillside, down here in the valley. But this is the knob. It's now supposedly a protected area. I hope it stays that way, but you never know. Um, this is the knob, though, on September 12th. Uh, I went up there at dusk on September the 12th at sunset because I wanted to see and hear what it looked like on September the 12th, which would have been John A. Washington's last sunset. And I went up just to listen, smell, 
790. Because the next day, things weren't going too well in the war there. There were a lot of, um, you saw that area. This is where the idea of global warfare started here in Western Virginia. And the woods are, even today, if you go a little bit off 219, you're, you're in a wilderness area, and your GPS isn't going to help you. Even on Mingo Flex Road, my son got lost the first time he came out to see me. He tried to use GPS and put him up on some back bridge somewhere. We used to have skiers land at our house off 219, trying to use their GPS, and said, just forget it, don't use GPS. It's not even good out there. You're out in the wilderness. And a lot of times, you turn cell phone signal, except in my driveway. So this virtual wilderness, I and mean, the soldiers on both sides, on Valley Mountain and guys up at Elkwater, the Union Army, they were basically bushwhacking each other in that whole nine mile expanse from Valley Mountain to Elkwater, doing reconnaissance missions, going out and checking the right flank, checking the left flank, trying to see where the other, the other guy was. And all that was going on. At one point, these needed some reconnaissance stuff. They, things weren't going too well. Um, and he sent out his son, Rooney, to go out and do a reconnaissance of the enemy's right flank, the Union Army's right flank, no quarter. And Johnny Washington, begged supposedly to go along. Now at that point the rain had kind of by about September 11th or 12th the rain had abated. But the, the whole battle site that was going on there, I remember Johnny Washington the fifth in my interview, he said, you know what, Marie, you know what the Germans history? I said, what? He said, weather. <laughs> and a lot of these battles were based on weather and things in the Alleghenies weren't going well at all for either side because of the weather. So around the 12th, sun broke through. And on the 13th in the morning, the next This is dawn on September the 13th. The same year I went out to see the sunset, 2012. This is dawn. This was Johnny. I watched the sun come up in the Valley Mountain. This was his last dawn. This is kind of what it looked like. That terrain hasn't changed at all. And way up north is where the Federals were. Way up in here. And so Robert E. Lee sent out his son for me on horseback and a couple of cavalrymen, Johnny Washington, to go and reconnoiter up there on the right flank. Let's see, three years ago, Hunter Lesser and I, Lesser and I, decided we were going to figure out what happened. So he and I went on a hike using topographic maps. We used Jedediah Hotchkiss's map. And I also came across in a library what I believe is John A. Washington's last dispatch. They stop at a point and you wrote this. It's in pencil. This is a photograph of a tiny little piece of paper, no bigger than a little notebook. And it says, We went a little beyond Heavener's house, say about a mile beyond Raven's Gate. We saw no signs of the enemy. And he goes on and on and on. He even has a date, 220. He's describing how far they had gone, 
where they had stopped. And they were going to go a little farther. They were going to go cautiously. He sent the lieutenant, Fort Manoir, to go one hour and return. We will go cautiously a little further. And so here's what happened. So the Union Army at the at Elkwater, you have on the left Union General Joseph Jones Reynolds, and on the right you have Sergeant John Wyler of the 17th Indiana Infantry. At the same time that John A. Washington and Rooney and their contingent of cavalry came out of how do I describe it? They call it a defile in the mountain, basically is a creek bed, and came out. And supposedly, they could see at the end of the road a man there on horseback. And John A. Washington supposedly said, Oh, let's ride out and go get that fellow and see what he knows. And supposedly, they left. The other men behind at the foot of that file of the mountain, and they rode galloping down that road. And as they did, Sergeant Wyler's men were coming from the north and ambushed them. Shots rang out. John A. Washington was shot and killed. Three shots to the back. Supposedly, they were going around a fallen tree, and as they wheeled around, the shots rang out, and he was shot in the back. He fell. Rooney supposedly ran in the opposite direction back to where the cavalry was waiting, hopped on John A. Washington's horse with a sword on it, John A. Washington's sword, and they rode back. He rode back to where the Cavalry was waiting, and John A. Washington expired there, fleeing, gasping and asking for water. Right nearby is a little, it's called a elk water run, it's a little stream right there. So Hunter and I scouted all that out one day, just, just to see, to satisfy our curiosity. And again, the area hasn't changed all that much. So we, we think we pretty much got it. What happened? And basically, it was an ambush. It was just one of those three things where Sergeant Wilder and his two men, the 17th Indiana, were coming out that way at the same time they were going. Isn't that amazing? So here's what the field looks like today. This is this. so we figured they came, John A. Washington and Rooney came out over these mountains. And way down the end of this road, there's a dam there now, the Elkwater Dam. That defile I was talking about where they came down a creek bed, that's all part of the dam now. So you can't even go beyond that. There's no way to get back in. I've tried. Really, in a pickup truck and getting stuck down on the end of a bridge, but you can't make it down that way anymore. But as near as we can figure out, they came up this road, riding up this road, and up here is a hillside on this side, was where Wyler and his men were. They looked down, they had a great view looking down. And at that time, the guys, these guys, were wearing white, like a white, uh, piece of paper in their hat so they, they wouldn't shoot at each other. You know, to, uniforms at that, I'm not a real uniform expert. From what I understand, though, the first year of the Civil War, the Union Army didn't actually wear blue uniforms. And they, the Confederate didn't wear the butternut color yet. I don't know, maybe they were similar in color, the uniforms. So, Probably why they wore the white, the white tag in their hat. 
So when the wilders men looked down, they saw these two wilders coming with a white tag in their hand. They knew right away they were Confederates and, and shot them dead. Right here on this road. If you're interested, Hunter was with the um, Civil War Cecil Centennial in West Virginia. He wrote a book that you can do your own driving tour of this area of the war in Western Virginia. I don't know if it's still available, but it's a three day driving tour. You can do it yourself. I would recommend reading this book first and then taking this along. He used to do tours. I don't know with COVID if he still does the tours anymore. But anyway. So that's what happened with John A. Washington. When the men got to him, he was gasping for water and he died. The men didn't know who they had shot, but they knew it was somebody important because of the uniform, the gauntlets. Um, the other things he had on his person, his pistols. Um, and when they went through the pockets, they realized they had John, he had killed John A. Washington III, the last Washington to own Mount Vernon. Took him back, took his body back to the federal camp at Elkwater. And at some point, of course, Rooney went back to Valley Mountain. Lee sent a message and ask for the body back of John A. Washington. Now, I understand that you've killed uh, Washington. You know, we need to do a body exchange. And that's what they did. The next day, they brought the body uh, to a, a meeting place and then took John A. Washington's body back to Valley Mountain. At some point, I'm thinking they got him to Monterey, you know, on a train back to Richmond, where eventually the family buried him. At Wayland. He's no longer very good. I'll show you that one in a minute. But, um, and all of his, what they called contraband pistols, the, uh, his knife that he had, all of that was divided up among soldiers. So you can read that account if you ever go to UVA. A man named Levering, John Levering, was a quartermaster. You can read his memoirs at UVA, where he tells about what happened. He says, he said, he exclaimed, my God, give me a drink. They gave him a drink, and fearing the return of a party, gathered up their trophy and carried him upon a hastily improvised litter toward our camp. He died in a few minutes, saying no more. And basically, the men called him, you know, we've killed the traitor, Mount Vernon. That's how they viewed him, as the traitor of Mount Vernon, or something Mount Vernon, and for the uh, Confederate. Like I said, they divvied up all the contraband and then sent the letters back to the family. Okay. In 1928, a group of women from the uh, United Dogs of Confederacy in Elkins got together and paid for and had made a marker to John A. Washington, the one you saw earlier. All right. That's how I figured that out. I wrote an article about. The marker in the December 2015 uh, magazine, the Jefferson County Historical Society. But in 1928, the women dedicated the marker that I showed to you earlier. And then in 1930, they had another dedication. And this time, so they did the point. This woman right here, this is a descendant of John A. Washington III. And her name is Samuel Washington. 
So they rededicated it. Eventually, Route 2 is right off 219. Um, you can try to go look for it, but I'll tell you, it's really dangerous to find it. So, um, a couple of twisty curves. There's logging trucks coming down that way. But it's up on the hillside, but it's still there in one piece. Uh, there it is. Okay. On Valley Mountain, on Mingo Flats now, there's a monument there to the men who fought for Lee. And here we have a picture of Zion Episcopal Churchyard in Charlestown, West Virginia, where all the descendants of John A. Washington III and his brother Richard are buried. So you can go there, they're all buried there. And on the right is a photograph of John A. Washington's grave and monument at Zion Episcopal Cemetery. This past May the 3rd would have been John A. Washington's 200th birthday. And I decided I had spent years researching this man. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to commemorate his 200th birthday. So my brother, sister-in-law, and I went to Zion Episcopal, and I took a rose. The Washington family at their reunions, when they have a family member that died that year, we do a little service, a little commemorative service, read a short biography, sing, let's, let's be, you know, die, that lines, and sing that, and then they put a rose down for that relative, and that's what I did do. My brain is too hungry. When John A. Washington died on September 13, 1861, remember Eleanor had died previous October, their seven children were left orphaned, all under the age of 17. The youngest one, George, um, he was two years old. So they weren't the only family affected like that during the Civil War in both the North and the South. A lot of children were left orphans. The interesting thing, though, about the marriage between John and Eleanor, their love letters are there at Mount Vernon. There are hundreds of them. And they must have had a really good marriage. Because when I read their letters, they're loving, they're tender, they're sweet. And they exchanged you know, hundreds of letters. And I like to think about them all around February 16th, which would be their anniversary. And I think about that's kind of a tragedy. You know, here's this guy who thought he was remember going back to my initial quote, people that are their destinies are determined by their decisions, right? And what leads people to make the decisions they do, and they, they can't anticipate the consequences. Well, he certainly didn't. But I like to think about them on their anniversary. And sometimes I think about, well, I think about this song about them. And I'd like to end with this. My love is like. A red, red rose that's slowly sprung in June. My love is like a melody that's sweetly played in two. And farewell, my own true love, so deep in love. Till all the seas get dry, till all the seas get dry, my love, and the rocks melt with the sun. Oh, I will love you still, my dear, till the sands of time shall run. And fare thee well, my own true love, and fare thee well. Oh, my, I love you.
Questions or a lot of, a lot of material there. Um, yes, sir. The Please children. Repeat the question. I'm sorry. Repeat the question. Oh, the question is what happened to the seven children? Well, they went on, and you know, I showed you two of them, Anna Mariah. She uh, married Beverly Tucker, an Episcopal minister. They had to be like 12 or 13 children. And Beverly Sherid of um, the Maranac New York, who gave me the photo to use and got the permission to use it. She's descended from Anna Mariah. Um, Washington Tucker. Um, another daughter, Louisa, the oldest daughter, Louisa, married uh, Colonel Chu. Are you familiar with him? He's a famous cavalry, uh, Confederate cavalry. Uh, cavalry. Um, their second daughter, Jane Charlotte, um, she also married. Um, some of her descendants are still around, but I'm not, I've met some of them. Um, then you have Eliza, whose picture you saw with the violas. Um, she married, she, you know, she's kind of sad. Um, the kids, what happened was they had to live someplace and they couldn't live at Wayland by themselves. So for a period of time, Judith, who was an aunt to Eleanor, stayed at, um, she was a widow by then. She stayed at Wayland with the children. The older daughters went off to stay with friends and so forth. So they, they were like farm all over the place. Eventually, Richard Blackburn, John A. Washington's younger brother, uh, took them into his home. Sadly, Richard, after his brother was killed, tried to join the Confederate Army and Lee sent him home. And said, You have a big enough responsibility in taking care of because he had seven kids. All these children looked like something like 14 kids all together from the two brothers. But can you imagine how, you know, how a man would have felt being told to go home and take care of the kids? I don't know. <laughs> but he wanted to do his duty. So, good question. Yes. How did we take this? I mean, from what I understand, such a bad spirit in West Virginia, it sounds like this one bad spirit. So, Margaret's question is how did we feel about all of this? Well, um, he and Walter Taylor, they, they were devastated by the loss of John A. Washington later. Um, Taylor in his memoirs talks about that. But he, he was like, he's only like 22 or 23. And to see somebody that you slept in a tent with, you rode over the mountains for days with them, and there they are lying cold and dead. And it was like really, he even says that to see you know, him lying there dead. It really affected him. I read where that last dispatch. That Lee kept it in his pocket for the remainder of the war. So what's that tell you? Yeah. And then eventually it ended up with the older daughter of Louisa. Yeah. <coughs> freaky, really freaky. Isn't it freaky? I mean, I find that a really freaky <coughs> circumstance. Yes. There's one cause of separation of what <laughs> no, 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 the question, a wonderful question. What caused the separation between Virginia and what we now know as West Virginia? My gosh. Oh, I'll just like real basic. Virginia, the Tidewater area, those are all plantation owners. They were involved in, you know. They have a whole different lifestyle compared to the people in Western Virginia um, who were just kind of hard scrabble farmers. Um, politics? Yeah, but there was a, I read a quote somewhere 
where some, I think you've probably seen this, where someone, had, they captured a Confederate soldier with a private and said to him, well, what are you fighting about if you don't have any slaves? He said, because you're here. They invaded his, his home, and that's why he was fighting. So, yeah, I mean, what people thought about the war in Virginia in Tidewater and around Richmond compared to, and this is just a really basic answer to your question, the people over the mountains on the western. And that was a whole different story. Like I said, guerrilla warfare started out there. There are some, you've got to get Hunter's book. I hope it's still in print. There are some horrific stories about, oh my gosh, finding like a whole family murdered, you know, under the guise of, you know, war, when actually it might have been some little scores they were settling. It, it's horrific, some of the things that went on. Literally, when you talk about neighbor fighting neighbor, that is going on in Western Virginia. Yeah. To this day, I'll tell you this story. A historian told me this one time. Pocahontas County High School, which I taught at, the land that it's on, when they wanted to build the high school, there was a lot of animosity between people who still to this day have union sympathies and people with Confederate sympathies. And they all lived in Pocahontas, Randolph County. When they wanted to build Pocahontas County High School, they had to find land that was kind of neutral to everything. That's where it is today. So I had no idea. I'm from Philadelphia. I never saw a Confederate flag in person until I moved to Pocahontas County. And I, I, I don't know. The first time I saw one, I was like, ooh, ooh, I've never seen one. But you travel down there, you go like over the mountains in the Bath County Highland, like they fly with impunity, but it's a whole different mindset about the war down there. To just, uh, you know, when they finally got into the Shenandoah and fought up and down, travel was a Route 81 there, all those battlefields, they decimated the breadbasket of the South, that whole Shenandoah. They, they still haven't gotten rid of that, truly. Um, I don't know. Why do we still study the Civil War? It's my question I ask myself every On that note, thank you everyone. Marina will be up here to answer questions.